to our panel. This is the first time I decided to, um, based on what somebody said to me last week, do a little slideshow because for sometimes for the people in the back, it's hard to read the names, right? But you might you could see it. Um, you probably know who Greg is. I don't know why. You would know right away. <laughs> he is my token male for this panel. And he doesn't <laughs> mind me saying that either. Um, so I'm going to try to make this work. I did embed. Oh, look, it's not working. OK, I give up. <laughs> when in doubt, pull it out. Who said that? Um, <laughs> Um, sorry, I was just trying to picture him saying that. Um, so I had embedded some um, video for some of these people, but their personalities and work kind of speaks for itself. Um, so unfortunately, Shannon Flynn, who, our television director, couldn't make it today. She had um, one of her kids got hurt. He's okay, but she has to take him. He's five. He gets hurt. Um, she has to take him to the doctor today, so she apologizes. She's awesome. I might have to add one of her stories because I, I went to graduate school with her, and um, she has a really interesting story about fortitude and sucking it up to get where you want to be. <laughs> this panel is part of what we call the University Project. It's a collaboration that the California, California, sorry, I'm short, but loud. Uh, the California State University System, I represent the Entertainment Alliance for the CSU system. It's 23 campuses. It's the largest public university system in the nation, if not the world. It's also the most diverse, most accessible, and has some of the most top-rated entertainment arts programs. Um, so it's my job to shout that out really loud and make people aware that you and that's awesome if you went to USC and UCLA <laughs> and Northwestern and wherever. Um, but also say, hey, you don't have to just look at those, the Stanford people, the Yale people, the Northwestern people, the UCLA people. You can look at our programs too because as the most diverse system and as both technology and entertainment have an issue with diversity, you know, make the change you want to see. Start from the bottom up and the top down. And I'm here to help do that and talk about it and show the people why our students are really hardworking and talented too. And a lot of people have worked with them. If you need an intern, let me know. Um, so we are discussing with all these amazing creatives and executives a little bit about how they got where they are. In a sense, how did they go from campus to career? How did they? make that transition, and a lot of what we might speak about are things not to do. Um, Yvette and I decided we're going to write a book called Don't Do This <laughs> by Simone and Yvette. Yeah. We just decided there, that. There are the volumes whole... of books, by the right. way. Right. <laughs> yeah, but this is our interpretation. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, learning by experience. But we have people representing all different aspects of working in entertainment, and what I like to tell students and people starting in their career is, the entertainment industry, you know, instead of making widgets or this irritating dongle that wasn't working quite right, um, in a sense we make content, whatever that may be, whether it's live or digital. Um, but we, they're companies. They still need lawyers and caterers and sales and marketing and PR. Yes, and your director, your producer, your writer, your creatives. Um, your finance people, who's going to do your taxes, who's going to, you know, so whatever your interest is and skill sets are, there is a place for you in the world of entertainment. And there's more than just, you know, the top of what people see, producer, writer, director, star. There's a whole world out there of opportunities and need. So we're slightly representing that. And I know personally some of these people went to college with one of them. And we all started maybe wanting to do one thing, and maybe a lot of you in the room are like that. I studied this, but now I'm a this. It's like, how did you, why, how, what's the story behind that, and how did you make these opportunities happen? So the first person we're going to speak to, we'll do it in order, because I had it in order of the sli these fantastic slides. 
that you can't see. But um, I had it in alpha order. It really doesn't matter. Um, sadly, I, um, or amusingly, because I wanted to show this really bad because I embedded a video, Shannon's first gig. I'll just tell her story really quickly. I went to grad school with her. We went to a drama school. She was studying directing. Um, she's from California, Southern California, and wanted to come back home for a variety of reasons, and also wanted to start a family, and met, this is why I say this all the time, so how did you get where you are? Well, intelligence, charm, and perseverance, talent. Who you know, luck and timing, right? But you can make, in a sense, your own luck by putting yourself in situations, by being in this room right now and networking and meeting people. That's what you're doing. Um, so she decided to do that and in a very nice way, there are ways to do this, forced herself upon a mentor who um, was a well-known, very rare, like a unicorn television director who went to the same program studying directing as her. And she was, excuse my language, her bitch for years mm -hmm. while she worked in a cafe in her 30s. Sucked it up. She is now a television director, years later, right? But I remember um, I was living in LA at the time with her and for a job opportunity, I moved back to San Francisco. And she said, oh, I, I just got this gig on, I'm working for Disney Channel. The Disney Channel, I was like, children's television? You wanna direct children's television? Or, And she said, yeah, it's this weird show. And she told me the name and I'm like, I was such a snob in my head about it. And she said, it's called Hannah Montana. <laughs> but my job is helping the director, but I also am the acting coach for the kids. <coughs> Miley Cyrus is her best friend. <laughs> so never be a snob about anything. Um, and I was going to show, I hooked up a video to her current show. She's directing this year's Betch, it's called, on one of those, <laughs> that would be E-T-C-H, but the video wasn't to Betch, it was to um, Wrecking Ball, because <laughs> I thought it was funny. Um, it would have been funny. So let's start with Darlene, who is here. Um, you guys read their bios, right? Darlene is a showrunner, producer, writer, best known for The Big C, which you created, is that created right? The big C, yep. How did that, let's start with that and then we'll go backwards. Okay. Because that is one of your best known, one that's, of them. That's my signature, that's my industry signature. signature. You, sure. You're like, I am cancer, I represent <laughs> cancer. Um, does everyone remember that show? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, with Laura Linney. How did that come about? Um, well, I, I had gotten to a place where I had a writing agent, I was, was pretty successful at going out and, and pitching ideas and getting paid to write pilots. So I would gotten to the point where I'd written 12 pilots, uh, none of which had been picked up. Um, and then, you know, finally the next season rolls around. I actually sat down with a producer and this is, I sometimes I have to remind myself of this story when I struggle to think of like, oh, what's my next creative idea? Um, you know, that's kind of what a producer does, um, is help you find ideas. And I had a general meeting with this producer, a meeting I hadn't been excited about going on for various and sundry reasons. And uh, we were talking about ideas for shows that we did not think would actually make it on the air. And um, she said, I have an idea that uh, um, I think it's time for a cancer comedy. <laughs> and I was like, you just sort of, that, that just sparked to me because I'm all about like lightness and darkness. And, and for me, I, I have trouble writing like farce or anything that's just funny for funny's sake. Like my, my funny comes from real dark places. Um, so I, you know, I noodled that and, and we stayed in contact and my agent said that's a t terrible idea, don't do that. Um, and, uh, but we did it anyway and, and um, she sort of pushed the studio to, to let us take it out. And I mean, it was, it was all a very sort of dramatic birthing because then I, I pitched it to a few places and then the studio says, said, 
you know, we're kind of losing faith in your pitch because you don't seem excited. And I was like, I'm losing faith too. I just wasn't going mm. well. And partly because we were pitching to network and didn't feel like a network show. And I had trouble finding out what was funny. Anyway, took another break, went back and, and uh, actually ABC and Showtime both wanted to buy it. And we said, let's go to Showtime. I'd never worked in cable. And, um, and that's what we did. So the trajectory of that journey from the initial conversation to getting picked up by Showtime, how long was that process? Um, maybe a few months because oh, then we were that. sort of working within the development season, you know, where you start meeting, you know, taking out your new ideas like in the summer, late summer, and then they start hearing pitches. This is sort of networks. Now things are changing and people kind of hear pitches all year long, but sort of you still have a certain tradition of like we, you know, we I sold it maybe late summer or was writing it, uh, was finished writing it by January kind of thing. So let's go backwards, um, again, as part of this educational experience for some of the students in the room and for anybody, actually. It's, it's, these stories I find are really interesting. So I know, because I met you in college two years ago, um, <laughs> that we were studying to be actors. We, went, we were theater majors. Um, so. Were you writing back then? Um, Never writing. In fact, I did about? write a play in college, and uh, everyone else that I, with a group of like theater friends, were like, "Let's write our own play." And um, and then everyone, <laughs> like, literally made we had to bring in scenes, and everyone made fun of mine. And I was like, "It is terrible." They're like, "You constantly having like parents saying, hey, sweetheart.'" Like, I don't know. It was terrible. <laughs> like everything was. They're like, it was just. Uh, uh, I don't know, but. Um, I was all about the acting, all about looking for my light. Um, after I got out with my theater degree, I, um, I started doing stand-up. I was all about um, not, I, I'm, I'm real proactive, I believe. I mean, what else, what else are you going to do? Um, so constantly making goals for myself, constantly every day how to do one thing for my career. Um, and when you're an actor, you can't just sit around and wait for the next audition and wait for someone to see what you have to do. So I started doing stand-up. Um, really, I'm not really authentically a stand-up, but I felt, well, that's a way to kind of hone my acting skills. And what I didn't realize is that was also honing my writing skills because mm. you're writing jokes and you're writing material and you're writing stories and you're finding your voice. And um, then I started doing some commercials and I moved out to LA. And um, I'm also a big fan of saying yes and to everything. Um, and save sex. Save sex. I feel like I should say that with that too. Of course, condoms. Uh, but um, <laughs> yes, and in terms of like, you know, career opportunities. And um, I did a commercial and it, it was a promo for NBC. And they were like, wow, you did a lot of improvising that commercial. Maybe you would like to write some promos for us. I was like, oh, I don't write, I don't do promos, but yes, and I'll be there Monday. <laughs> so I started learning how to write promos. So again, I was like honing my writing skills. I mean, one thing led to another. I, I wrote this short play just so I could do something, so I could perform. Um, and performed it out in, in LA, paid for the theater myself. Sean Hayes was a friend of a friend. I who saw came this play, she doesn't remember. Platonically incorrect. I saw, because Steve Thank was in you. it. Thank you, that's right. That's Our nice friend one. Steve, who knows everybody. Yeah. And Steve was a friend of Sean Hayes, and Sean Hayes was on Will and Grace at the time, and he came out and saw it, and he said, could I be in your play? And I said, well, I don't have a play for you, but yes, and I <laughs> can. And I wrote him a part, and he did the play, and then I had a writing agent said, can we sign you as a writer? And I was like, I'm not a writer, I'm an actor. Um, but of course, yes, and I will write. Um, and I literally, I mean, I, I did have it, that was a big crisis for me, like where I was, um, nobody wants me to act, nobody wants to see my face on screen, and this is what, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then I got a great advice from an acting coach who said, ride the horse in the direction it's going. You're getting this opportunity, go, go with it, see what happens. And literally after I started writing more, I did, ended up getting more acting work than I ever had before. Mm. Um, so it was kind of an amazing thing that, that happened. And I've been doing both ever, uh, you know, ever since. I mean, they, you know, can't always do both and it gets a little complicated. But at the same time, whenever I think of like, man, what would have happened if I had time to audition for pilots and maybe be on a series? I think, what are the chances? I mean, 
the it's mm -hmm. it's better just to work in this business and be creative and and I, I get to do that a lot now so that's good. awesome advice it sounds like you're kind of just saying make your opportunities happen yeah get out there and your say book yes. is entitled yes, yes and <laughs> exactly. and vet who has um, and everybody's read the bios, right? I don't need to go into, she's a multimedia producer, VR writer, director, extraordinaire. She's the most exceptional, diverse entertainment industry person who gets more meetings on the planet than anybody <laughs> I've ever known. So we must understand the key to this. <laughs> if there is one. If there is one. Um, Okay, well, you know, let me let me start with that because she asks me this all the time. I do. She does. She does. Uh, so yes, I, I definitely go on uh, many meetings, um, but you know, these meetings uh, for me, meetings are earned. Meetings are earned, and and in terms of your career, so um, there are many avenues to how meetings come about, and you know, so relationship. We know that this is a relationship business. The beginning, middle, and end is all about relationship. So every day, you know, who, who are you meeting, who are you meeting? And that can lead to a particular meeting where you're pitching or generals or, you know, meetings that they could actually turn into work and, event and eventually dollars, but it really is always about the people that are around you, the networking, being a good person, <laughs> yeah. being a good person to the people that are around you, supporting them um, and allowing them to support you. Because this is also something else that I, I notice in the industry, it, it's not necessarily even about ego, but sometimes when people need help, they're not necessarily the first ones to say, hey, I need help. Mm. Um, so, so just that kind of making those real human connections so that there are some vulnerable moments where you can say, hey, I, I actually do need help here, et cetera. I think, that, I think that can be really powerful, especially when you're you know, just starting out. But in terms of the meetings, um, you know, representation, obviously that's one avenue. Uh, your own, uh, uh, being in the business long enough where you, where you establish relationships and then those become open doors. So when you have a new project to pitch or you have just something that's going on or just, or just to catch up, you know, mm -hmm. always, you know, never forget that you want to be a good person and, uh, and really um, make real human connections. So you want to you wanna make time for these people that are very important in your life. Um, so it's a variety of different avenues as to how you actually get, you know, get the meeting. It isn't one thing. I speak uh, at many yes, events, so I'm meeting people there and that leads to other uh, opportunities for for meetings, uh, and uh, and I'm also very involved in the community, um, the diverse uh, the the diversity community. I'm very involved there, so that leads to another other other roads and inroads. So, really, what I would say is um, that you need to be out there, creating relationships, networking all the time, but the real human connections that you do make, follow up on those because mm -hmm. those are really the ones that will serve you and you can serve those people and those lead to more relationships because you tend to get referred by people who really know you uh, mm -hmm. and really trust you and you've delivered for. So all of these things actually lead to the many, many meetings that Simone is referring to. <laughs> and um, she's quite amazing. She literally just got back from a certain film festival in France. I don't know how she's even <laughs> awake right now. So I, I just really appreciate you being here and offering us, all of you, um, but, you know, Venice is closer than Venice <laughs> here is closer. Um, so really appreciate it, and that's Thank great you. advice. Really quickly, do you want to talk a little bit about your baby, Dark Prophet? I have it up oh. there, and I can even... Sure, want. sure, sure. Um, well, and just to bit. give you... Sure, and just to give you a little bit of, um, you know, history of myself, because I definitely... Um, you know, I, I have a, I work in a couple of different areas of, of the business and, and really television and, and VR, those are, those are my primary um, areas of, of focus. Um, I also, you know, do work a little bit in film. I actually have, um, you know, two film projects right now, but it's mostly television and, uh, and VR. Um, I'm from New York, if you can't tell. <laughs> and and uh, I went to NYU uh, Tisch for film and television production. My, uh, my senior thesis film ended up winning the best of NYU, got me a lot of buzz, and that's what got me out to LA. And, um, but, I've but seen that movie. Wasn't that a movie with Kevin Bacon? <laughs> I've seen that what movie. Was it? What was it? Big or big time or it's really funny where he wins the, he wins his like USC uh. film competition and all the studios want him. Big picture. Big picture. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. Don't watch it, it's depressing. 
<laughs> no, but it's funny. It's a very similar story. So uh, I'll have to. I'll have to. You uh, have to yeah, see that. I'll have to check because you're one, one degree of bacon right um, now. For sure, and we're all like what six degrees away from Kevin Bacon, That's apparently. <laughs> so, um, but but before that, and you know, basically for myself, I grew up drawing, painting, and writing. So visual storing, uh, visual storytelling was always my thing, and it was what I had relied on. It was just, it was just me. And I always knew that. I knew that I was going to be to do something creative, and it was going to be visual storytelling uh, in in some way. And the uh, and the drawing and the painting that led me to graphic design and interactive design and video game design. It's very much a yes and kind of scenario where it was like, oh wow, so you know you 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 do graphics and you know you can you, uh, you can like design websites and 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 do these really like high-end flash interactive experience it's like sure yeah for sure and I would just learn it in a day because it came very naturally to me and I you know and I would do it and then I would become an expert in that in that kind of thing um, and the video games that you know was just very organic um, but for me it was always storytelling and it was always visual storytelling regardless of what if I was working on the actual uh, the what it looked like and, and also just the user experience there was always a story to that and that actually is why VR is, was a very natural evolution for me because VR is very much that. But um, so I was always in this uh, art, artistic and digital kind of uh, technical um, area of entertainment. And then my writing, that led me to traditional storytelling, the writing, directing, and producing. So once I actually got to LA, I basically just really merged those skill sets. I started working at the digital departments at the studios. Mm -hmm. And Universal, Sony, Disney, you pretty much name it. I have the New York Hustle, I work 25 seven still. And um, so I freelanced all, all over town. And one of the great things about working at the digital departments at the studios is that you're working on everything that the studio has going on. So I was working on television projects, creating digital content for TV shows and features, um, video games, theme parks, comic books. Music, a lot of music, because you know, as we know, the, many of the studios they're they're the conglomerates of uh, the record labels that are left <laughs> on the planet. Um, so, uh, so I was just creating all of this different kind of content, and I really honed my skills uh, in terms of uh, multi-platform storytelling. Like, I really learned how to tell a story, whether it was a visual story or it was literally words on a page for different mediums and formats. Uh, because uh, for me, it's all you know storytelling. It's it's all about the story first and the medium, the platform second. And uh, so I, so again, I just really honed those those skills. And then after a couple of years of that and freelancing all over town, I built up a really great network. Going back to make friends, um, you know, do a great job when you're working with someone, so that you can con that continues to be an open door. You get referred, you know, etc. So after a couple of years of that, I. Um, I, I started my, my own company called Digital Rain. And with my, uh, my boyfriend at the time who made the pilgrimage over from New York with me to LA, and uh, we're married till this day. But uh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, what I, I was actually sharing this story in, in con uh, with, uh, with a woman um, who lived in LA for several months. She just actually moved back to London and, and she was you know just telling me the horrors of the dating scene in, in LA and I said well you know I was actually saved from all of that and she was like oh my god you're so lucky but uh, <laughs> and it sounded even so much cuter with her with her accent but um, but uh, but anyway so you know so we started this company and uh, you know again creating all of this digital content and that was great but after a, a few years of that and building the business I had gotten away from telling my own stories I just didn't have the time to finish my scripts finish my projects and this was around you know 2007 just before 2008 and television was really uh, it was it was the beginning of what we call peak peak TV mm -hmm. now. And literally the Sopranos had just gone off the air and Six Feet Under was winding down. Um, you know, it was it was just post wire and you know certainly shield, but we knew that we were in a new era of television for those who were really paying attention and, and who were creators and, and who were writers. So but I really wanted to learn television. So I, I knew I had to change, you know, my life because I just couldn't, you know, work twenty five seven at my job uh, and and also be able to create my content. And I'm very much a creator, a writer, creator. I have tons of ideas. So I was always developing, but I just didn't have time to really finish. So I decided to go to grad school, uh, and I went to UCLA because they had a uh, two-year concentration in television called the showrunner track. 
and that was exactly you know what I needed, um, which was fantastic. And you know, the first year was half hour, and the second year was one hour. And but I ended up having to be there for three and a half years because it was through the screenwriting program. But and that's another story. But anyway, um, before I graduated, the NYU Tisch has a thriving alumni here, and um, they had a call for entries for their alumni for a digital series lab that uh, which which they modeled very much after like a Sundance digital series lab. So I had this idea, Dark Prophet, which for me was absolutely always it needed to start in the digital space. It was that kind of a property, and it was very very multi platform. I knew what the app was going to be. I knew what the game was. I knew what was I, what I was going to be doing in social media, and uh, so I submitted it. Uh, for that opportunity, and there were you know over three thousand submissions, alumni submissions, and Dark Prophet ended up winning that. Wow. And uh, the judges were NBC Universal Television executives, and I got a production grant from NBC Universal, so I kept making episodes. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Sundance had uh, heard about me in the project, and they really loved it. So then Dark Prophet ended up premiering at Sundance in 2014, and there were direct. TV executives there who really who really connected with it. So then this digital series then ended up airing on a direct TV channel. And because it, it was on TV and it did really well, and it, it ended, up, ended up being nominated for two Emmys in the interactive category. I lost the Game of Thrones, but I can live with that. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, so it's absolutely an example um, of the yes and yep. You just go with momentum, absolutely. You do what you need to do every single day to pay your bills, uh, make relationships, uh, hone your craft. You know, I mean, definitely, because that's what we always have control over is honing our craft. Mm -hmm. um, but open every single door and, and take advantage of every single door. So that's what I did with that particular project. And obviously that opened other doors for me. Um, and then, uh, you know, and then VR was just such a natural evolution for everything that, that I have ever done. Uh, and my focus in VR is very much scripted narrative mm -hmm. because I'm a storyteller. So uh, for the last three years, I, I have really been focused on how do you answer the question or how do you create, um, how do you tell a scripted narrative story in VR? So yeah. that's, that's my area. Cool. That's a lot. I just, I just wanted to put out there really quick. If you have any specific questions during, feel free to raise your hand because I don't like waiting till the end because it's not about me. It's about you're here to ask them questions. So if you have any questions right now, feel free to ask or whenever. Just raise your hand and I'll keep looking back. Um, aha, Kevin. Hey, Beth, can you tell me about your canned experience? Uh, I've been there. Sure. I, I, mean, I think it was a it was really a, a, a stellar uh, year for Ken. It was my first uh, Can, um, and, and I was invited by the festival and the Hollywood Reporter to speak on virtual reality storytelling. So I had a bit of a unique um, experience. But I think also because there was really a large VR presence um, at Can, they they literally had a conference for five days. It was uh, it was a conference within the con within the event, um, and that was. Uh, a really huge step for them, and then also television. They had a television presence, so it definitely was a was a year where even the Holly that that international foreign um, you know kind of traditional film world now can no longer deny emerging other emerging medias and how important they are in terms of entertainment. So um, you know. It, it's just a stellar um, festival all the way around. The people that go are the real players, the you know fi financiers with a lot of money, uh, top producers. Um, I mean, I basically met everyone, and uh, and everyone's just really open. I mean, ev everyone's there to meet, to pitch, and uh, just looking for for new opportunities. So it was absolutely a place where you can do business. Awesome question. Um, you brought it up. Thank you for the segue. She brought up the P word, the pitch, um, which also that's really good at. But um, so this panel is not meant, this is about a conversation about working in the industry and how these people got where they are. Um, please do me a favor and don't pitch anything to these people and don't ever pitch anything to anybody. Actually, legally, you should not be doing that because, and they should not be looking at it because God forbid something seeps in, they could sue, I mean, maybe you'd like to sue them, but they will, it just shows you're kind of a novice. Just don't pitch. 
create a relationship with somebody. Don't ever say, I have a script or an idea. Please. Make sense, right? Okay. Just like they said, create relationships. Be the person you want to work with. That kind of thing. Thank you for bringing up the P word. So, Mr. Catano, do you tell us of your interesting journey, which started in film school too, right? No. No. I was, um, <laughs> not quite. I was radio, TV, and film at Long oh. Beach State. <laughs> And uh, what, what I thought would be sort of interesting to you if I can just let you all know that if I got to where I'm at right now, then anyone can make it. Because <laughs> I, I never thought of myself as very book smart. I saw my friends go to Ivy League schools and I wasn't a very good test taker. And I just want to say that it was just through hustle and being ethical and learning how to organize my mind, because even early on I realized that I couldn't really organize my thoughts, and I'm sure a lot of you in this room have that trouble. As an artist or as a creative, sometimes we're just over, you know, our minds are flooded with all these ideas, and it's everything from creative ideas, and I gotta change the oil in my car, and I have to, <laughs> you know, do laundry, and I am actually, been going around speaking quite a few years at different schools and recent, more recently I've been speaking in front of my peers as far as how to organize your thoughts. And it's called the formula for happiness. You know, it's a, it's a little bit of a, you know, a tongue in cheek title. It's actually somebody really had. cool. He's shown me bits of it. It's like, and it's so simple yet profound. Thank you. Yeah, it really And is. I realized it was the tool that I needed to, again, organize my own thoughts just so I can function but it turned out to be the most powerful tool that got me to where I'm at. And I, I'm just humbled by the fact that I'm sitting in front of all of you today as a pretty big evangelist influencer in the virtual reality scene. And I don't take that for granted ever. Uh, and there's not a moment that goes by that I'm not just you know, humbled and, and gracious for being there. So if, if I may, I'd like to go from the beginning Please and do. tell you a little bit about how I knew that I was wired and I had a sickness of being an entrepreneur. And I didn't realize I was an entrepreneur back then, but I was 14 and I remember coming back from a wedding with my parents, I'm sitting in the back seat, and I hated the DJ, as a lot of us tend to do. And I'm sitting there in the back seat and I go, I could have done better. Right? I could do this. And my parents looked back, they said, do what? I said, oh, that DJ was bad. That DJ sucked. And they said, so what? Um, what, what are you thinking? I said, I, I could do it better. I think I could be a DJ. And rather than saying to me, oh, what a silly idea. That's just a crazy idea. You're not going to do that. You know, you're, you're crazy. They said, how would you do it? And that changed my life. And to this, to this day, I, I, I love thinking back at that moment because they have always been supportive with me, being the only artist in the family and seeing all my friends getting into, again, Ivy League schools and getting into science. And my dad was an engineer, my mom was a physical therapist. You know, I must have been left on the doorstep, you know, because <laughs> here I was, this crazy audio guy. I would just listen to audio and I can see it. And I couldn't explain it to people. Everyone thought I was nuts. And I ended up being a pretty successful DJ here in LA. Born and raised here in LA. And I, I did pretty big, pretty big promotions and, and it, was, it was just a great hobby. What was your DJ name? I'm did not you gonna have tell you. <laughs> <laughs> My friend Lima in the audience has been pushing me for a, for a long time. At <laughs> we'll go out for drinks one day. And <laughs> uh, at the time, I, um, I didn't have any money. Um, my parents gave me a little bit of money just to, to, to get started. And I would just buy records with whatever little money that I got from allowance. And I figured out how to beat mix. And I, funny story, I was sitting in the toilet. <laughs> and uh, my we're friend, one of my here. friends were, we're I know, friends. sharing too much already, right? Uh, my friend's sitting in the next room playing records, and I was thinking to myself, I don't remember us owning that record. And I went outside, I said, wait, 
where's the so-and-so record? I didn't know we owned that. And he goes, oh, no, I was playing this one. And I went, oh, go home, get your turntable. We're going to put both records side to side. That's what the pitch control is for. You know, we adjust the pitch. And it, it, things like that just came pretty easily to me. And I realized that that was just the precursor of everything that I think I'm able to figure out or that I have been able to figure out in navigating this industry. So I was a DJ, didn't know what I was going to do with school or with my career. And my mom and dad said to me, they go, well, what about film? What about television? And I said, mm, I, don't, I don't. I think audio is really my, my strength. And that's when I applied to Cal State Long Beach because they had a really good audio program at the time. And, and it was pretty much the only school I can get into <laughs> at, the, at the time. You know, I wasn't going to get into a UC with my grades at the time. But I got in, and right away I found out that, I, again, I wasn't a great test taker. So I didn't do well in school. I was on you know, probation multiple times. But then this entrepreneurial side kicked in, and I started looking around at what was on campus. And the one thing I have to say that Long Beach really did for me was have opportunities, like having a, its own radio station. They had KLON, which, was now, which is now KJAZZ, but they had, a, they had a commercial radio station on campus. They had a cable station, and they had a pub, and I applied to mix for the bands that were playing at the pub. Little extra cash that would give me free food. You know, I'm a college kid, you know, better than noodles, I guess, right? And I got to mix bands at night. So here I was working at the cable station, the radio station, and mixing for bands. And still going to school, still taking my classes, but again, not doing very well and, and not really being very engaged with the instructors. A lot of them didn't work at the time. They didn't work in the industry. So that was... That was a, a troubling thing for me because I felt that why am I taking lectures from somebody who hasn't really experienced what's it like to be in the industry. So it was really about just figuring out what made sense to me and really going against the grain because all my friends were talking me out of it. They're saying, why are you killing yourself? Why are you working so much? You need to slow down. But I realized this was probably my one opportunity to have a little bit of leverage before I got out into the real world. I didn't think that my grade, you know, my, my GPA or even having a certificate was going to be enough for me. So I'm working for the radio station at KLON, and they had a state-run news program called CalNet, and it was high pressure for a student. It was really high pressure. It, they did not mess around. It was a, a professional statewide news show. And you got yelled like you would in the real world. You had deadlines like you would in the real world. And it really thickened up my skin because I just had to you know, stay focused while you had these reporters yelling at you and saying, we have five minutes before airtime. You know, where are you with, that, with that, you know, that audio piece? And fortunately for me, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the show Marketplace on uh, public radio. They reached out to KLON or CalNet and said, who's your star editor? Who's your star engineer? Because and we're looking. And that was you? And, they, and that was me. So then you so became. And you said that. I did. <laughs> <laughs> I was just the backup. No. Yeah. But good, they, uh, they ended up picking me, me uh, up to be one of the engineers. And here, if, if you don't know what Marketplace is, it's a nationwide syndicated radio show on public radio. And I was getting paid. Uh, the, the skills that I learned at the, at the CalNet radio program really bridged that gap. And obviously, it was a lot more pressure, you know, a lot more you know, um, uh, deadlines. And, but that gig was great and then just a little bit later probably after a year i hear about this company called 525 and at the time they were the top music video house in the country they were doing prince and michael jackson and guns and roses and i had heard that they were the place to be so i uh, i said okay i'm gonna make this move i'm gonna start serving coffee and uh, let's see what happens they ended up hiring me and they put me right into management because I had some management from school. And 
that uh, that ended up being this this really you know amazing you know uh, opportunity. And then from there, I said, okay, I'm just fearless, and I'm gonna I'm gonna look at new trends. I'm gonna go out there and just try things. And the one thing that I had mentioned already is that just by being ethical and just by you know having a good moral core has really served me well because as I would go out and, and, and step out on this limb and try new things, I would always have the support of people around me believing in my ideas and saying to me, Greg, you have this track record of just you know, filtering out the noise, going against the grain, but when you have a gut feeling about something, people listen. And if they trust you, if yeah. They, if if they you've trust built me. that relationship and trust, and excuse me for interrupting, but that's a really good point for you, those of you who are here still in school. Please, you know, your professional life starts then, actually, and look at the people around you. Be the person you want to work with, especially if you're in the creative entertainment studies programs. You're usually collaboratively working on projects. That could be your future production company colleague right there. And, you know, it's true what they say. It is a very small world. Like, people have come back into my life. Like, just don't be an asshole. Just right, don't. Right. And I'm I mean, I shouldn't even have to say it, but, yeah. you know. You know what? I'm, I'm going to speed this up. Obviously, I'm, I'm giving, you know, too much of my resume here. But the, the, the big thing that I like to impress upon with students, because uh, I teach, uh, I've been teaching at Otis College for a while, and it was... The reason, or the reason for for wanting to teach, was because there weren't a lot of people there to help me. There weren't a lot of people that I felt that I can talk to, or you know, people were being being very coveted with their knowledge at the time. So a lot of it was, okay, listen, uh, I did it with school. I uh, I'm I'm not really seeing a lot of people supporting the people that want to break in the industry. So there's that yeah. quote that Kevin Spacey had, you know, when you make it to the top, send the elevator back down. Yeah. Everything that I try to do has an altruistic angle to it. Every, every company that I've had, uh, why I teach, why I, I'm out there promoting virtual reality. Yeah, I say be the change you want to see. Like, I want more right. women on regular panels, not on women track. There you go. You right. make it happen. And, and you know what, there's, there's plenty of work to go around, especially in the VR scene. Maybe not just maybe a handful of years ago, LA went through a tough time, as we all know, but with virtual reality, it's the most bullish I've ever been on a media movement because of the enterprise applications. So Very interdisciplinary. When you, you think back of everything that entertainment has done in, in the past. You know, we have uh, television, we have visual, uh, uh, television production, we have visual effects, we have edit, you know, editorial, we have web videos. Uh, when we start to see tax you know, credits happening and maybe an oversaturation of, of um, entertainment um, um, workers, that it became very difficult for all of us. And when virtual reality came around, I said, wait a minute, stop. Entertainment is going to do fine. You know, you're going to have the people backing that. But then now you look at enterprise and you say, wait a minute. Now you talk about medical and education and training, and what an amazing thing to happen for students to under to know that they're not just limited to entertainment. That you can use those same skills. And I got to tell you, production is production is production. I was one of the earliest guys yeah. in 3D. I produced the X Games 3D movie and Red Bull. And I don't say this stuff to say, you know, to toot my own horn, but that we do these projects and then we say, wait a minute, there's no distribution. Yeah. Nobody's going to buy the 3D televisions. And, and that's the other thing that I can leave with you is that I'm willing to check my ego at the door and say, my stuff is not going to be seen or there is no revenue here. So when I'm out there talking about virtual reality, I'm saying it may not be the sexiest thing to talk about because everyone wants to only talk about storytelling, you know, a lot out of a lot of my friends, is that we gotta talk about distribution. We gotta talk about how do we bridge the right. chasm between okay, the Okay, that's another makers, conversation. Right. And <laughs> Which the, it and is the and it's important. 
He used to teach marketing and distribution. But, yeah. um, but thank you. I, I but hope it I didn't. Sound, uh, I'm just going to sum it up because there's a thread here of putting yourself out there. Do you see it? I mean, yes, hard work, fortitude, keeping on, keeping on. But, you know, saying yes, putting yourself out there, finding your own mentors. The world doesn't happen to you. That's what I'm getting here. Right. Yeah. So on a totally different, same entertainment industry world, we have Gretchen who does some really interesting work in management for, how, who's been to Arclight Cinemas? I mean, can I not say, right? One of the first of the trend of the gorgeous to have dinner, wine, come to your table, right? The leader in that, to me, when I, when I was living in LA in the early 2000s, it was just Arclight. There was no, the Sundance cinemas hadn't started or um, any of the other from Texas folks, right? Right, We're, we just celebrated our, our Arclight Hollywood is 15 years old this year. Wow. So Amazing. I know. It's so it was that long ago. Huh? Well, I said, if I was thinking to myself, <laughs> if, uh, if Greg is the token man, I'm the token non-creative, I don't know, nerd on the, on the uh, panel because of all the, all the creativity that I'm hearing and everything um, that you know, w we, on the business end, get the benefit of, of playing, of showing, and um, I, I didn't go to film school. I grew up in the Midwest. I'm from Kansas City, and I um, um, was an econ major. My big, the big, uh, the wild thing was staying to get my master's in econ. Um, but but then you know I was the head film buyer for AMC theaters for for about 18 years. How did you get? There, um, you're an econ major. Like yeah, so it was, uh, I guess, ironically, the economy. Um, when I got out of school, it, I wanted to go to AMC to do uh, real estate development. And mm. my my master's thesis was on infrastructure and traffic patterns, and I wanted I wanted <laughs> I know to um, I wanted to find you know, find space do projects for AMC. It was the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s. The economy was in the toilet, and um, they offered me a position in their film department with more in um, back in the day film settlement, where it was a very very intricate uh, deal to settle film with the studios and and. So I, that's how I got in. That's how I started with AMC. So I was there for 18 years, moved up wow. uh, to become their head film buyer um, as they were acquiring Lowe's and becoming you know, what they are now. Um, and then I got a call from Arclight. And there was one, Arclight Hollywood. And they were, um, it's privately owned, family owned, third generation. The Foreman family were the only Los Angeles based um, exhibitor. The Foremans are, um, started with drive-ins up and down the California coast and in Hawaii, and then moved to hardtop megaplexes when, when the drive-in trend went away. And, um, and then Arclight became the next step for that. And Chris Foreman, who's our current CEO, who's the grandson of the, the man, um, William Foreman, who started the company, just loved movies, had such a respect for writing, had such a respect for the creation of movies, and said, there has to be something better than this. I can't every Friday go and have my feet stuck to the floor, watch commercials, and, and have the neon flashing at me as I go and started the idea for Arclight, and, and people thought we were nuts. I mean, reserve seating, who did we think we were? You know, our noses in the air. Which was actually, you know, having, it was pretty common in Europe. Like any, because um, I lived abroad, very, and it was yeah, only it was, reserve seating. It was seating. only reserve seating, but here, I mean, the studios, I mean, the, they would not sell us film in Arclight Hollywood. I mean, you could have shot a, uh, you could have shot a cannon off in that theater for three years. Wow. I mean, they wouldn't sell us film because they didn't think anyone would come, and it was actually Star Wars. I don't know if anyone remembers this, but it was it was Star Wars in. What would it have been? 2002. Um, that was at the Chinese. That everyone assumed it was going to be at the Man Chinese. And Fox sold us the film. And so we had stormtroopers go to the Chinese and they marched all the people in line <laughs> behind the stormtroopers down. I mean, if social media was in place then, mm. we would have had a uh, field day. Um, but it's, um, and, and now, we have, uh, now we have 12 arc lights. We, we moved outside of Los Angeles about three years ago to Washington, D.C. and Chicago. And, um, you know, as, as I get invited to these panels and, you know, talk about the business of Arclight, it really wasn't until, um, 
you know, the, uh, you know, a few years ago when the content disruption really came about and, you know, people think, oh my God, you have to hate Netflix, you have to hate HBO, you have to, all of that because people don't go to the movies and, it, and it's not true. We're, um, 2015 was a record breaking year at the theaters. We thought 2016, there's no way it equaled 2015. And 2017 looks to break that record. And, you know, movie going begets movie going. Good stories, you know, there, there's more. If you're watching something wonderful on Netflix or HBO, you're going to be more interested in paying closer attention to what's on any platform, whether that's it's. That's true. And it's, that's Could, what. We having, find. having taught and done a lot of work around distribution, um, you know eight years ago, that fear, the studios didn't want to, in reverse, sell the films to Netflix right. because of the release windows and getting them in the theaters and making that money first and all of that, not seeing that different people like to watch in different ways, different target Absolutely. markets and different audiences. It's movies everywhere, mm -hmm. whenever, wherever. Like People want to have an experience going out for a date. People want to chill out at home, they're tired. It doesn't forbid yeah. one doesn't one forbid the other. the other we've seen so much better content so many better you know so much better we play films at Arclight we did the, the Kurt Cobain doc was opening on on HBO it was that two springs ago now and we played it for five days at Arclight Hollywood and did five hundred thousand wow. dollars and then it's it's like our third biggest movie of all time and you know, and that was knowing. I mean, it was opening on HBO in five days. People knew it. We knew it. They knew it. They used it as a marketing tool. Um, but it's you know, there there is there. I feel like there's so many. There's more stories. There's better stories. And then we also saw, you know, we saw the, the streaming sites, we saw better content going to subscription television, to network television, but then we also saw the emergence of, of um, you know, Amazon movies, of A24, of, you know, these smaller companies that, you know, took the place of the Weinsteins in the 80s or, you know, that used to be just specialty film, but really growing a lot of different, a lot of different storytelling, a lot can of I, different Can diversity. I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. If, if there was someone in the audience who isn't necessarily a creative or wants to be necessarily a producer but wants to work in entertainment um, in different areas of management like you do, how would you recommend to them that they get their foot in the arc light door or any door? Best it, piece of advice. You know, exhibition is... Um is tiny. I mean, we are we're ArcLight and Pacific Theater, so we own the Grove and Glendale and, and those theaters. And uh, there's 24. We have 24 people at our company, and so I mean, not counting line managers, obviously. So exhibition is is small, but it is. Um, but social marketing, PR, those sides are are always growing. Um, the business side of things, more from um, an overall. Um, the holistic approach is, is what we look for as we're bringing people in, and I, you know, and I think that's what the studios do too. Um, they look at you know that that whole bigger picture, um, and I think you know from what everyone here is saying. And again, I think I was I don't know if I was chosen for my opposite, but you know if I had one thing to tell you, to tell young people, to tell my my younger self is take risks. I mean, I took no risks whatsoever. I mean, I, it, it just, I, when I turned 50, I think I was finally like, I got to do something here. I've got an awesome piece and, of advice. Also, you know, <laughs> take risks. Maybe that's what it is. But yeah. it's also a realization that as, as, um, as I oversee all the films that come into ArcLight and all the content that comes in, you know, there is a, there is a power and a creativity in that. And I was just thinking, you know, this week we're opening, you know, the next th three or four weeks as we look at the busy summer starting, we're opening, a, you know, a big blockbuster type movie that mm -hmm. are coming, Pirates or Wonder Woman. But as I look at how busy we're going to be and you know we're opening six movies next week only one's a big studio film mm -hmm. the others are small independents or they don't have I play films that don't have distribution I play films straight from the filmmaker mm -hmm. um, so you know that's where how does that happen um, I just heard some what <laughs> 
Uh, usually it's films that we see at festivals. There's films. I mean, I, uh -huh. uh, we, we see a lot of movies So you have week. people on your team scouting yeah, that for... Yeah, we, you know, we, we see... Like the smaller know, theaters. The smaller too. films. Yeah. We get a recommendation from somebody cool. that maybe they saw a film that their company, you know, that Amazon couldn't pick up. But, you know, they'll call me and say, this is a really great film. It didn't fit with our... You know, and we've played films before that we've played and then they've gotten distribution. Mm -hmm. Because you know, kind of a little, almost a little grassroots uh, uh, marketing that came out of the theater, but it's there. You know, we really can promote and have a play in a lot of. You've um, developed products. people's yeah. creative careers. I just want you to know that <laughs> if you've ever thought about. Well, and, and it's it, interesting. Do you, I don't know if you guys know Bob Bernie. Bob um, Bob's a great guy. We've worked together for a million years back on the on the uh, my big fat Greek wedding days. But he's at Amazon now and heading up their film. So he's teaching a class at USC this this year, and he invited me to come and, and speak. And when he introduced me, of course, I was so embarrassed. You know, he's telling me there's just like she wields all the power for award season, and she, you know, all the power is in her hands for what film she chooses to put on the screens. And and you know, and a, a tiny, tiny bit of that's kind of true. Of, uh, all of a sudden, she was well of what you know if if you know there's all of these films. We've only got 15 screens at ArcLight Hollywood. And, you know, yeah, ultimately you have a reach there's, you know, in there's, the town that is the reach. A lot, so, so um, you have a question. Can you make it really brief? I have. Sorry. Oh, I don't have to go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, you do. After our back and forth. Is there a question? So how many different Oh gosh. Um, we've done we've worked with Netflix, we've worked with Amazon, HBO, um, like I said, it's the films that just don't have distribution at all. Um, we I'm trying to think of anything that's just got, you know, direct TV, things that are going direct, you know, straight to direct TV. Um, it sounds like if it's good yeah, and it's out it's, there, if you'll... it's good, I mean, one of the promises, the Arclight promise was, was when when Chris built the company was uh, a variety of product and, and a focus on good storytelling. And so that's where, you know, our partners in exhibition, you know, everybody has a different business model. And to draw a line in the sand and say, if it's not holding to a 90-day window, if it's not this, or if it's not this, we there's a point that it, it, it violates our brand promise to our guests where we want you to experience it in the arc light way. And if it's a great story and we can make it work, we absolutely will do this. And we've done it where it's been one show, one week, one day. Uh, we do a lot of stuff with... Um, with um, uh, at Turner Network with classics that you know they'll they have their film festival. You guys on think TBS. out of the box, period, literally. Yeah, and, <laughs> and try box. and try to do that. So it's um, it was it's very eye opening to you know when you make that kind of revelation. Like I, I you know my hands are tied. There's really nothing I can do. I've got the big studios. I've got this. And then when you through the evolution of your career can figure out a way where you can make a difference. You can change course and and still you know can still you know, serve that world but you start thank you that lighting. is the perfect segue to yes. our next uh, you wrapped it up yourself thank you <laughs> um so we have heather who also has an interesting you remind me a little bit of shannon how you that classic story how'd you get where you are as a writer on who's seen better call saul great show that's right thanks she co-wrote last season's finale i just want to mention that which is pretty great yeah i put that in the Instead of don't do this, like do do this. Do write a finale with your boss. Yeah, <laughs> that's no. right. With um, Vince, she wrote. So, are you from Missouri or Kansas? Kansas. Most people don't know that. So, do you like the Jayhawks or? Yes, the... I'm a Jayhawk. Okay, that's fine. I'm from <laughs> I'm from Nebraska. We don't oh, like okay. the, we don't like the Kansas State Wildcats. Um, <laughs> yeah, an exam and also I you're not the only nerd on the panel. I it, the we were talking about I studied this. And then I was, I studied biochemistry in college. I went to, <laughs> I went to a small, yeah. yeah. I went yeah. to, like, there's one person in here, like, yeah. But, I went to, a, like, a small Lutheran college in Nebraska. I was, I got a volleyball and a biochemistry scholarship, and I was Lutheran. 
which I think they should give it uh, off track. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, so I studied biochem because I was going to be a mortician. <laughs> uh, nice. And my dad and my uncle and my grandpa uh, run funeral homes in Nebraska. And it sounds like a prolific business, but the towns are so small that sometimes people die like once every three months. So it was like, eh, like, and I was always reading, 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 but I never thought, I thought writing was something you do when you, you can't get like a real job and you're trying to just have hobbies. And um, I ended up going to New York for a semester because there are Concordias all over the country. There's one in Irvine. And um, when I was there, I started going to theater and um, going to black box um, theaters and watching one act plays. And I was like, this is amazing. Like I'm already reading all the time and I looked like Kenny G and I was sucking my thumb a lot. Not in college, grade school, <laughs> but um, I was a loser. Uh, I, so I decided like I was gonna try to do more writing and so I took a summer workshop in Nebraska that was run by this UCLA MFA professor named Lou Hunter. Um, and uh, he's wonderful. I would recommend his uh, 434 book to anybody who wants to write. Um, so <laughs> I decided I was going to get a writing job in Nebraska. So uh, obviously I worked for the railroad. <laughs> and um, I, saw, no, I saw an ad in the paper that was like, do you like to travel and write? And I was like, yeah. I, mean, I, like, I have no idea what this is. And I showed up to the interview and they're like, so do you want to be a journalist for the railroad? They have their own newspapers. And I'm like, wow. Yeah, <laughs> and I don't yes. know anything about railroading <laughs> or journalism, and I'm going to do this. And so I did. I did that for like two and a half years, and it was really fun. I, I traveled all over the country and went into like freight yards with my hard hat and my steel-toed boots and talked to like retirees about welding things. And, um, and I, I was a photo I was taking my own photos, so I became a photojournalist. And I, like, I'm the kind of person, like, if I'm going to do it, I don't have the patience to suck, so I'm just gonna like go, you know, do it all the way. So I tried to get really good at it. And then, um, you know, I just, I wasn't satisfied. I took one screenwriting class in college. Well, no, no, it wasn't. It was a journalism class and I did a paper on screenwriting. Um, and that was the extent of my undergrad education in, in writing. And then uh, I decided I was going to come to, UC to L.A. because that's where I needed to be, and I wanted to tell stories. My mom, to back it up, was very young when we were born, like everybody is in, in Nebraska. And um, so she had a variety of jobs, and one of them, she was a projectionist at our, at our little theater. And we only got one movie every two weeks, but, and so it was PG or PG-13, so I grew up watching like the Goofy movie. I'm not a cinephile, I'm trying to work on it. But uh, I got to sit up in the booth and like learn how to change the reels and stuff. So I was always like into movies. Um, You're like the Nebraska version of Cinema Paradiso. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You all thought that, I know you did. I know. Yes. Um, yeah, so I, I moved out to LA and uh, I kind of, targeted the people that I really, really wanted to be around. And I was like, well, who's doing what I really want to do? And that was, at the time, it was Laura Ziskin. I moved out here in 2008. And uh, I had to make money, so I nannied. Um, I had to get some writing samples and learn how to be a better writer. So I enrolled in the UCLA professional program in screenwriting, which is a night class for people who are working day jobs. Some were lawyers, some are, I mean, like, most of them weren't writers at the time. So I, I did that for 10 months, and I wrote two features um, and a pilot on my own. And uh, I was interning for Laura, and I learned how to do coverage pretty well, but I said yes to everything they were asking. And I, wasn't, I was older than most of the other interns. I basically stalked them into submission. I called them enough times, because uh, I didn't, I was naive. But I called them and was like, can I work for you? They're like, no, no, no. And I kept doing that, and then finally I was like, can I do it for free? And they said, okay, <laughs> yes. Uh, so and I think the only reason they kept me on is because I was the only person in the office who knew how to drive a stick shift, But because a boss drove a stick shift little car, and I took it to get her lunch every day. Uh, so learn how to drive a stick. And uh, th after that, I, um, so I was nannying. I don't remember if I saw I said that or Okay, thanks. Um, so... I heard, because I got pretty good at coverage and stuff, the director of development at that company, Sasha Mervin, um, she heard about a showrunner who was looking for 
a writer who had nanny experience. So that was like what? very lucky. That's so lucky and, in time. And I was like, yes, I want to, I want to do this. I had just finished the program at UCLA, yeah. so I turned in a writing sample and I went to the interview and it was Jill Soloway, who's now show running Transparent. Um, she had just gotten off of Six Feet Under. I happen to know some things about funeral homes and nannying. I, wa I like SpongeBob. We talked a lot in the interview about SpongeBob and nannying. And now I have Claire's desk from Six Feet Under in my living room. It's like my favorite thing in the world. I write at it. Um, so I worked for Jill for a year and a half as her showrunner's assistant on United States of Terra season two for Showtime and then How to Make It America for HBO. Um, that she co-show ran and then after that she needed me to, to drop to part-time work and I just couldn't like I needed money and uh, my parents aren't sending me anything they were still like I don't understand what you're doing there and uh, <laughs> they still call my scripts papers like how are your papers going <laughs> <laughs> they're so sweet I don't, I don't correct them so uh, yeah so so uh, I asked Jill like I, I had never asked her to do anything and I like that what you were saying like don't my approach has always been like, what can I do for you, not what can you do for me? Mm -hmm. And because I had never, I had never asked her to read anything, do anything, I asked her, can you please send an email to people that you know saying that you've got a good assistant who's looking for work? And she did that. And one of the people that she sent it to was an, uh, an executive producer on uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. And um, he didn't need an assistant, but Jeff Garland did, because he was firing someone every like third day. <laughs> and, and so when I went into the room, I, I got the job. I got the job at the interview, um, and, which was weird for me. But uh, so I, my first day on the job, they were at the production meeting. And the way we went around the room, and, and everybody stood up and said what they did. And Jeff didn't go. He sent me by myself. It was terrifying. And after everybody went, Larry David was like, ah, stand up. Let me get one, one last good look at you. So like nobody thought that I was going to stay. <laughs> And I ended up staying for four and a half years, and I worked for him on uh, uh, Curb, season eight, and then um, The Goldbergs on ABC that he was starring in. And he's also a, a director, filmmaker. Um, he's just had a feature come out on, on Netflix. And um, so I was a, a, an associate producer on a feature that he made called Dealing with Idiots that starred Bob Odenkirk. And I, I was also doing sketch and improv and stand up on the side because uh, I wanted to know more about comedy. And at the same time, I um, finished doing the movie with Jeff, and then I, I was still working for Jeff. I applied for the master's program in screenwriting at UCLA. I did, probably didn't need to do that. Like, nobody was saying, you're going to get a better job or you're going to get more money. But I wanted to be a better writer. So I did the master's program. Uh, I finished in two years. I got out in 2013. Um, and about that time, um, Better Call Saul was starting. And I really uh, love... Vince Gilligan and Jeff and Vince had done a show at Largo. I love everybody on the show. But at the time, uh, Vince, I, I was so nervous when I met him, I called him the wrong name twice. Uh, <laughs> super embarrassing. I don't think he remembers that for some reason. What'd you, but, call, um, him? What'd you call him? Like, was it a V name? Peter and Tom. The, oh, okay. other, other people who worked on off. the show. Yeah. That okay. were, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, that are now my bosses. So, uh, uh, I started working. I got, I had a couple interviews for them and, um, had my master's and stuff, and so I finished. Um, I, I finished working with Jeff, and I transitioned over and did. Um, I was a writer's assistant season one on Better Call Saul, and then season two I was a writer's assistant. And what does that mean to be a writer's assistant? So I was a person in the room. I was in our room. Nobody has any tablets or smart phones except for smart brains. But they. Um, so I'm the only person who's taking notes. So I would compile notes, and at the end of the day, I would make a long outline, about 15 to 20 pages, and send it to all the writers. Um, I did things like I kept a master calendar because Better Call Saul is a Breaking Bad prequel series. So we have like all the years from Better Call Saul to here, and we know exactly the day of the week that the show takes place on. We we use letters and stuff. I also got some opportunities to write. Like I wrote all the audition scenes for the for the cast because um, we don't use the real scenes from the script. Um, and then season two, I did that, and I was a script coordinator. Um, and I also co-wrote the finale with Vince. Um, I wrote a pie fetish video for one of the characters. He, like, he sits in pies and cries. I have, like, a, I like dark comedy. No, that is a thing, just so you know. It is. It's called it's called. There's a guy sloshing. called the pie man. It's called yeah. Yeah. No, I know. Uh, 
someone maybe I don't have experience me in watch that. it. I, <laughs> but I said yes, I'll do I'll do the pie fetish video. Um, and then I ended up doing the finale with him. And then season three, I just um, I finished we finished editing my episode number eight um, about three weeks ago, and it airs on Monday. What? Yeah. We did not plan this. I did not know. That's awesome. Now you're all gonna watch, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I would say like you know. I, you were saying, Greg, like there's there's a lot of places like TV is a, a big environment now, and like one person's success does not equal your failure, and that's an important thing that I remembered throughout is to be like genuinely happy for people when they succeed and be be genuine and be honest, and if you know, don't lie and don't you know if you say you're going to be somewhere, show up on time, right. maybe. Um, so yeah. That's an awesome story. As, uh, fortunately, lots of storytelling takes time, but do we have any brief questions right there? Uh, Greg, could you be able to tell us a little bit about the formula for happiness? Oh. Uh, can, you, can you do that yeah. one offline for people or send yeah, them course. somewhere just because of our time? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. so he I will share. The question was, can you share some of the formula for happiness? You know what? A five-second version of that would be, rather than just going 100 miles an hour, it's just to be productive is first, like a writer, I'm sure, is just put all your thoughts down you know, on, a, on a page, organize it, and then create your to-do list. And then a lot of people just go, okay, I just got to go. And then you're, you're tunnel visioned, and you don't seem like you're that was a good five getting anywhere. Version. So that, that's, you have that's a sort TED of it. Talk, Greg. What's that? I bet you have a TED Talk. We could all no, watch. but I, I told him do to you? do it. Yeah. There you no. go. Yeah. Well, I'll I'll I said also you should Thank write you it. Thank you for the question. A uh, great question. Anybody else? Quick question. What? They answered everything. Okay. So, um, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, I think this is one of the best panels so far. I agree. Thank you. 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 Many. You know, I feel like I had an obstacle like every mm. few months, and and just recently, like I I put I usually have several plates spinning because there's so much rejection, and usually, like I said, I wrote 12 pilots that great, I sold them, I made some money from them, but they didn't go to series. It was exhausting, so I, I'm always doing like so many things at once, and then. Um, I kind of was putting all my eggs in this one basket recently because I was like, I really think this is going to sell. I have a great actor attached. It was my passion project that I had written. I had an, uh, um, an Oscar-nominated director attached. I'm like, we're in. Everybody's like, bidding war. <laughs> and then I was like, so I'm not going to do a bunch of other stuff because I want to be able to focus on one thing. We took this all around town, and it didn't sell. And it was soul crushing. And I deal with rejection so well now. My mm -hmm. husband's always like, he's like, it's like, it's like nothing to you. I'm like, it's so. I expect it not to go. Like whatever, on to the mm -hmm. next. Right. But okay. that was like, soul crushing. It's like that AMC. It, uh, it's um, Mad Men was rejected by everybody. Is so that was right? Breaking yeah. Bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody. And but then I'm like, okay, on, I'm like, okay, how much time am I going to give myself to to lick my wounds uh, on that? And, and then uh, and then like just look at my other options. Let me go look, look read these emails. And I told my agents I didn't want to staff on a show. And then they called about the staffing thing. And I was like, oh my god, that's the coolest thing. I want to do that. And and that was after another thing that I went after. It didn't I? The meeting went terrible. But something else happened anyway. The point is, like, I feel like there's always the entertainment business in general is so bizarre, and it's yeah. so it, there's not one nobody retires from like a you know working 20, 30 years at the same entertainment job. So it's constantly it's learning how to, <laughs> how to adjust yeah. and change your goals a little bit. Yeah, it's um, you know the thick skin. It's hard because a lot of people who are attracted to entertainment in order to be a storyteller, you have to be a very open, emotional person in different, everybody's shaking their head. So, but then you're that wonderful, open, emotional person, so then you get battered by it. And sometimes it's experience that gives you that hard shell, you know, and just, yeah, it's picking yourself up. It's that fortitude, you know, that 20th rejection of Breaking Bad, 
And then someone like an AMC comes in to Mad Men, which that was completely against their normal, mm -hmm. what they show, and look what happened. So if he had stopped pitching or what, who knows what would happen. So that's a great way to leave. Thank you all for your time and your stories and you. giving you. back. You're, you're doing what you say. You're giving back. I really appreciate it. Also, um, so yeah, remember, no pitching. No pitching. <laughs> if, and they might not have cards. You know, they might. So, but they still love you. Still love you. Thanks, everyone.